Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Thanks for joining us today for our Bible study on David. We all know David was far from perfect, yet the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. We can learn from David how to seek restoration with our Heavenly Father through honest repentance. What God saw in David, he can see in us. We too can be people after God's own heart. And now, here's Pastor Chris Dodge with today's message. Good morning. Welcome to Awake Us Now. I'm Pastor Dodge, and this is week number 18 of our study of David, a man after God's own heart. I'd like to begin with some words from John Newton. John Newton lived over 300 years ago. He was an Englishman and was actually a slave trader in Africa. He experienced a dramatic conversion in his life and became a devout follower of Jesus. He would renounce slavery, go on to be a very vocal part of the abolitionist movement in Britain during the late 1700s. He is best known, perhaps, as the author of a great hymn. He became a pastor, and the hymn he wrote, Amazing Grace. John Newton would die in 1807, just a short time after Britain renounced the African slave trade and abolished slavery in the empire. John Newton is also known, however, for some other words. And those are the words I'd like to quote this morning. They go like this. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion, city of our God, he whose word cannot be broken, formed thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou mayest smile at all thy foes. John Newton was writing about Jerusalem. And that, my dear friends, is where we're headed today. Let's continue with our study. You will recall last week we had seen David anointed as king over all Israel as the elders of Israel came to Hebron and acclaimed him as their king. But once the nation was unified, David realized there was work to be done. And it was work that the Torah prescribed, what Moses had been given by God himself. This is what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5. The Lord said, but you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. And that's where we go this morning. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 6, where we read, The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. David takes what we know as Jerusalem. And with that, the country is unified in a very dramatic way. David does not keep his capital at Hebron down in Judah. Instead, he goes into what basically was no man's land. Jerusalem lies basically at the heart of the ancient nation of Israel and modern Israel today. Jerusalem was right dead center in the land that God had given to his people. But it truly was no man's land. If you look at the text, both here in 2 Samuel, but also the rest of the scriptures, you see there are some dramatic things that we are told about Jerusalem. It first appears in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 and 20, when the king of Jerusalem, a man by the name of Melchizedek, blessed Abraham, and Abraham paid him a tithe. That would have repercussions that would echo down through the ages all the way into the New Testament times. Later on, in Genesis 22, Abraham would take his son, his only son whom he loved, Isaac, to the area around Moriah, to a mountain that God would show him. And there he was to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice it would be the mountain where the temple would later be built. In Judges chapter 1, 8, we are told that the 
Judean, the Judeans, the people from the tribe of Judah, had actually torched and burned Jerusalem early on in Israel's conquest, but apparently were not able to keep it. And we read in Joshua chapter 15, verse 63, that they couldn't hold on to it. And then we read also in uh, Joshua 18, that it was the city was given to the tribe of Benjamin. That's King Saul's tribe, but they never possessed it. And so now David goes to take Jerusalem, a city that according to Psalm 87, is the most significant city in all the world. And that remains true today. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken formed thee for his own abode. And that is now what takes place here. And so we read these words. On that day, David had said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and the lame will not enter the palace. We have so much here. I'd like to start at the end and then go to the beginning, okay? The end. That is why they say the blind and the lame will not enter the palace. The Jebusites had mocked David and his troops. There's no way you can get into the city. You see, Jerusalem is built, the, the ancient city, Zion, the city of David, is built on a hill and a very steep hill surrounded by valleys on three sides. It was impregnable, at least in the eyes of its inhabitants. As a result, the Jebusites ridiculed David and his men and said, the blind and the lame can keep you guys off these walls. When they conquered Jerusalem, then the saying was, the blind and the lame will not enter the palace. There are some who believe that the blind and the lame were actually forbidden to go into the inner courts of the temple at the time of King Solomon and beyond. By the way, there is significance in that phrase in the New Testament because the blind and the lame are mentioned once again. It's in Matthew chapter 21, verse 14. It describes how Jesus came to the temple on the day we know as Palm Sunday. And we are told the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. David had kept the blind and the lame out. Jesus brought them in. How did he get into the city? Well, it all revolves around this phrase, water shaft. In Hebrew, it's one word, tsenor. And people have debated what that means. What, what is the tsenor? It, the translation water shaft is widely accepted, but there are all sorts of speculations that have been raised over the centuries as to what that water shaft or that sonor really was. However, in 1867, a British engineer and archaeologist by the name of Sir Charles Warren was exploring in the area underneath what we now know to be the city of David, ancient Zion he discovered what came to be called Warren's Shaft. It is a hand-carved tunnel through limestone that goes down to the Gihon Spring, the only source of fresh water in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, that, that discovery changed a lot of things. It also led to the discovery of Hezekiah's Tunnel, and we realized how water had been diverted from the Gihon Spring into the Pool of Siloam. But more than that, we realized that David's city wasn't where we had thought it was up until that time. Instead, we learned that David's city is south of what's known as Temple Mount. And uh, it changed our understanding of the geography of Jerusalem. But once you go down here to Warren's shaft, you will find not just this shaft, but a host of other tunnels. It's fascinating, and it is being, being researched and studied and excavated even to this day. Some of the pictures that uh, I've taken over the years are just fun to look at. Here is one going down through some of those remarkable tunnels into the area 
underneath David's city. And uh, we read these words then in 2 Samuel chapter 5. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the terraces inward. And here we have another one of those words that people have, have really pondered. What are these terraces? The Hebrew is milo. What, what is that referring to? It appears, and I want to stress, it appears. There's still so much to learn, so much to be excavated, so much to be uncovered. But it appears that those terraces, the millow, was a basically a retaining wall that was then everything around it filled in to expand the city. David caused the city of Jerusalem, along with his son Solomon, to expand in size, and it became his royal city. He would basically give it the name City of David, even though he came from Bethlehem. We read on, verse 10, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Note that David became more and more powerful, not because he and his troops figured out how to get into Jerusalem through the Tsenor, but rather because the Lord God was with him. And we see that right from the beginning in what is told us here in 2 Samuel chapter 5, namely that David seeks as the first action of his kingship over a united Israel to establish the place that God would reveal for the dwelling of his name. And from that time on, Jerusalem would become the most significant city in all the Bible. And as Psalm 87 says, the most significant city anywhere. Well, the text then continues, verse 11. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent envoys to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. And this is where things get especially exciting as well, because in the last several years, going back to the uh, early 2000s, about 2005, a brilliant Israeli archaeologist who, who died just recently, Elat Matzer, uncovered what she believed to be the remains of the Palace of David. King Hiram of Tyre was the king of one of the most influential city-states in the Mediterranean. From Tyre, Sailors would go out, not just all over the Mediterranean, but we are learning those sailors, Phoenician sailors, would get as far as the New World, we believe. And there is substantial evidence that they actually came into the northern regions of the Midwest, up into the Iron Range in Minnesota, and up into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. They brought ore back from all that we were able to determine. They were great sailors. Much of what they did was not written down, or at least not written down that it has survived. But from what we are learning, these people traveled far and wide, and they knew an awful lot about sailing that would be lost until the time of Columbus and, and his predecessors. But anyway, King Hiram of Tyre sends the necessary building materials to make a palace for David. And as I said, back in 2005 and afterwards, excavation started taking place in what appears to be that palace. I got to go in there for the first time when it had not yet been opened to the public. And it was one of those cases of not what you know, but who you know. And uh, I just remember being in absolute awe, walking amongst the ruins that had been buried buried for millennia, and uh, seeing many of the rooms that were part of that palace complex. It struck me that it was there that David composed many of the Psalms, including one of the saddest of the Psalms, Psalm 51, that he wrote after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband murdered. Today, Ordinary people can walk in to what appears to be the remains of the Palace of David. And here are some photos. First of all, I mentioned the large stone structure, the, the millow. 
and uh, excavations have been taking place around that stone structure and at the top of it, buried underneath mountains of debris, was the Palace of David. Here's a photo of the, the interior of that palace. And uh, again, you can see the informational posters that have been put up in there. You can walk through and see the remains. Now, admittedly, this looks pretty rough. But let's be honest, our houses would not look especially good after 3,000 years either. In fact, they wouldn't exist. But this has survived, built out of incredible amounts of stone and uh, beautifully done, apparently, in the past. Today, this is what remains. Again, some other photos just giving you an idea of what has been uncovered. And keep in mind, this was all buried for many, many years. The first time Jan and I went to Israel, this was not even thought of. In fact, we, we actually, we got stoned not too far from this site as uh, some individuals were rather upset with us and began throwing rocks at us. <laughs> That's another story for another time. But today, this area has been unearthed, and it's amazing to see incredible things that have been found in this region, including the road that led up to the temple at the time of Jesus, the pool of Siloam where Jesus sent the blind man who was then healed. These things have been uncovered for the first time in our lifetimes. And you wonder, what does this mean? What is God doing in these last days? I, I, that causes me just to stand back in absolute awe because as the world seems to be falling further and further away from God, at least in the West, God is showing himself in dramatic ways. There has never been a time in human history when there have been so many convincing arguments for the existence of God as we have today. We are learning things that are mind-boggling. And unfortunately, many of them are things that no one else gets to hear about. We'll talk about that in another context. In fact, starting in the year 2022, we're going to begin a series of messages that ask a lot of why questions. And it will include things about why believe God. Uh, but going back to David, here are the remains of his palace. And so we read then in the words that follow. I'm going to go to uh, verse 12. Then David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. Note that David is a man of faith. He does not take credit for this himself. He doesn't say, look what I've done. Look how much I've accomplished. I'm a great warrior. I'm a great king or anything like that. Instead, what does David do? David knew that the Lord had established him as king and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. In other words, David understood, this is not about me, this is about God. This is not about me, this is about all of God's people. This is about the plan and purpose of the Almighty. And David recognized that. But then we read these words. And these are words that are especially, I think, uncomfortable to many of us in the 21st century, for good reason. We read, after he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more and more sons and daughters were born to him. What is that all about? I thought in the Torah it says, God created them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his, with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Why all of a sudden is David marrying multiple women along with concubines? Mistresses is what we would call them, although they did have some royal standing. They just weren't top-notch top wives, in effect. What, what is going on here? First of all, we need to understand the times of David. In the ancient world, the way kings established their influence and cemented alliances was to marry the daughters of significant individuals. And so, as a result, kings would frequently marry princesses from neighboring kingdoms as a way of showing that we are one, we're all part of the same family, we have a good, strong treaty, we're not going to turn on one another. 
In addition to that, it appears that David married some women, were not given a lot of names and a lot of details, but married women who were the daughters of significant tribal leaders in Israel. It was a way of cementing the nation. Now, I'm not, I'm not condoning this. I'm just saying that's what lies behind it. And it was commonly practiced. By the way, it was something that God had warned the people about. And this is what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17. Speaking about the king, we are told when you have a king, and keep in mind, God was to be their king, but he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. How close did David come to that? I would say very, very close. His son would go the full measure. Solomon would end up with basically a thousand wives and concubines. And it would be his downfall, just as Deuteronomy had predicted, just as God had said. What we see here is an indication that David was not a perfect individual. David was a sinner, just as every one of us are sinners. Now, that doesn't mean that God condones our sin. It does mean we need to understand that he was a sinful man. But he was a man after God's own heart and a man who truly sought in everything he did to please and serve the Lord his God. That stands out very clearly throughout First and Second Samuel. But at the same time, we dare not overlook some of the issues that arose. And so we continue on then, verse 14, where we read, These are the names of the children born to him there. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, Eliphelet. Please note, Solomon's name is mentioned here, even though he was born very late in David's reign. But we see in these names the reality that David, David ends up raising a nest of young men who will lust for his throne and bring great sorrow and trial, not only to David, but to the entire nation. And it serves as a reminder that people can go along with the culture and just be children of their day, but there is a cost and there is a price to pay. God, in his initial establishment of the human race, made the family the primary building block of human society. And his plan was for one man and one woman to be united together for life. It appears, especially after the flood, that the taking of multiple wives became more and more common. In part, many have suggested to try to repopulate the earth and because child mortality and the death of women in childbirth was so much higher than what we experience in the modern world today. Nonetheless, when we go against God's initial plan, it brings serious repercussions. And that is what David experienced. And we will see in these coming chapters now of Second Samuel, David being used by God to accomplish great things. But we will also see incredible tragedy that serves as a warning for us in our day and reminds us of the importance of being faithful to our spouse, faithful to our God, and faithful to our family. David, unfortunately, would experience incredible grief because of the makeup of his family. And that makeup, the problems were exacerbated by his taking of multiple wives and raising multiple princes who sought to usurp his authority. It's a tragedy, even in the midst of one of the most glorious sections in all of the scripture. In the midst of David taking Jerusalem, we also see the root of many of his later trials and troubles. God, however, is faithful, and God can be trusted. And so, we read, these are the names of the children born to him there. By the way, four of those kids were children by none other than Bathsheba. 
Verse 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now, what's happening there anyway? I thought the Philistines were David's allies, you know, and, and what has taken place is uh, the, uh, the winds of change in the political realm cause a change in alliances. When David was simply king over Judah, the Philistines probably thought, uh, we'll support him because after all, he's at war with the house of Saul, our, our, our sworn enemy. But now that David is king over all Israel, the reaction is, we've got to stop this guy. And so we are told that the Philistines, upon hearing David was king over all Israel, went up full force in search of him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. What is the stronghold most likely? It is Zion, the city of David, Jerusalem. It may well be that at this point, David and his men were camped out north of the city in the open area there. But now he goes into the city itself, apparently for protection, but also to discern what would the Lord decide and what would the Lord demand. And it's there that we need to stop today because our time is up. We're going to pick up there next time. Let's join now in a word of prayer and uh, come before the Lord. Lord, our God, we thank and praise you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for the way you moved in the life of David and your people Israel to establish a place where your name would dwell. We thank you that Jerusalem, the city of our God, is the place where our Lord Jesus would give his life for us all and the place where he was raised from the grave. We thank you that he will return again to the Mount of Olives, overlooking the city of Jerusalem in the same way he left. Until that day, may we be wholly dedicated and committed to you. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to having you with us again next time. If you would like more information about Awake Us Now, go to awakeusnow.com.